I lived in my van for the first year in the parking lot, and you could do that back then. It was 1987 or something like that. Uh, and I had a neighbor, George Marks. Uh huh. Wonderful man. Uh huh. Uh, another one of those soul brothers who yeah. just accepts you for all your quirkiness. Yeah, you need that. <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, and George was my neighbor because he lived in Berkeley. Uh, and he was training to be a Waldorf teacher. And he was already a year ahead of me. He was in the teacher training. Mm -hmm. And he, since he lived in Berkeley, there was no use for him to, to rent a place. He was only in town for four nights and then he was going back to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he had a whole, you know, he worked at the Berkeley Rep. He worked there for years. Um, now George lives up in... Uh, up on the San Juan Ridge, I believe. Anyway, up you know in the Sierra Nevadas, uh, mm -hmm. great guy. Um, anyway, um, I realized that during my my foundation year that I was there because I was healing. Yeah. And then, and I looked around myself and I realized that everybody there was there because they're healing. I know. And 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 yet I felt like no one really acknowledged that. Because there was a sort of an arrogance that was going along with it, with you know, learning all this stuff. Well, if you're normal, you're normal. Um, so, um, so I did another year. I did the I did the teacher training, uh, but I knew I couldn't be a Waldorf teacher because uh, it would I, I I wouldn't I it couldn't keep I couldn't have that kind of responsibility. Simple as that couldn't hold that kind of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Even though I'd stopped partying, mm -hmm. and it was clear in that sense, mm -hmm. I, was, I was pretty clear that I wasn't gonna It's not it. so easy to hold all these children. No, it's not. So in the way that you're, the, you know, because they imitate you, so there we go. It's a huge responsibility, yeah. and yeah. I wasn't ready for that, and I, because I was still healing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I you recognize that. I, had a lot of, I recognize that, and, and it was disturbing for me because I just felt like I was one of the few people who was actually recognizing that. Yeah. Everyone was trying to get their career going. Yes. And, um, and I realized that, you know, anthroposophy is, comes out of this, what they call a Christ stream. Mm -hmm. And Christ was a healer. Mm -hmm. So it just seemed natural that whoever is drawn to anthroposophy is actually there because they're, they're trying to heal themselves. Mm -hmm. um, well, developing what we call an I. An ego, yeah. Yeah. Or a, yeah, an ego. In of the, course, in the Western it, sense. it goes. It goes two ways. Of course. Right. It's I just, or ego. Right. It's know. a knife edge. Yes. <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. I'll see. Yeah. So um, let's see. At the end of that of my first year at, at Steiner College, I realized I would get this really strong pressure in my chest when I thought about learning the German language. Ah uh, yes. Physical pressure. Uh huh. Um, that I had to go to Germany uh -huh. or somewhere where they spoke German. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I um, sort of designed a, uh, or planned a bicycle tour. So with a couple thousand bucks in my pocket, um, my passport, I, um, I figured out this plan that I could, you know, fly to Amsterdam, and I could ride to Den Haag, and then all over and visit all these Eurythmy schools. Right. Because I was, I knew that I wasn't going to be a Waldorf teacher. There's no way I could do that. But since I liked movement, and I enjoyed uh, some aspects of my Eurythmy that I got in Foundation Year Teacher Training, some things were alarming to me. But um, but I just knew that I naturally. Could you know? I could be a you mover. You could do something with movement. With movement, because I yeah. still wanted to be connected to Rudolf Steiner's work. Exactly. In some way, or yeah. shape, or form. Yeah, yeah. And yet, you know, I still have to have a livelihood. And I grew up on a farm. You know, I raised sheep and pigs, and went to you know with Boy Scouts and was in the FFA. So I knew I could all I could all either you know maybe find a rhythm training, or or work on a bot and a farm. But in the in the yeah. meantime, I could learn German too. Right, right. Of course, that's the best way to do it to go over there. It was, and yeah. I mean, literally, uh, and so, at, so during my teacher training year, um, uh, uh, a friend who was also in the teacher training, her name's Adrian Fox, uh, she thought that was a great idea too, so we, we did it together as a couple. So we did the bicycle tour. Um, 
we rode all around to these rhythmic schools and Bob's dynamic farms. It took about a month and a half, almost two months. Uh, we left at the end of uh, April. Uh-huh. Um, um, so we, 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 uh, we flew into Amsterdam like the plan was. We rode to, uh, took the train to Den Haag, uh, assembled our bikes at a train station. Oh, yeah. Um, rode over to the school. Mm -hmm. We spent a week there. Uh, and then our next, then we, then we, we went down to Utrecht, uh, this place in, 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 I don't know if we, we wanted to go down there for, you know. Well, mm -hmm. well, the thing is, is that I also had um, designed the, the, the bicycle trip so that we could see different uh, artistic works. Yeah, so that we makes had sense. A, yeah, we had a, a, an art history training uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Ted Mala mm -hmm. at Steiner College. Mm -hmm. And he had a really thorough and, and beautifully laid out uh, curriculum. And so I was able to sort of design my tour around these different places where yeah. these different works of art were. Exactly, yeah. And also where the arrhythmia schools were. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and then we, we are headed, all, we had, wanted to head all the way up to um, Hanover. Because mm -hmm. um, there was a school there. Mm -hmm. So that was our next long, that was our first big long stint of riding. And uh, that was beautiful because Holland is all laid out to ride. And the thing is, is when you're riding a bike, it's the closest thing to walking. Mm -hmm. You literally breathe in the elemental world oh, yeah. of, of that culture. Mm -hmm. You know, you see, you see the side of the road, all the trash, mm -hmm. and you see the flowers, and you, see, you breathe in the air. And, you're, you're in, and we did it in such a way that we, I don't know if you can still do it now, but, you know, but we would ride until it got almost dark, and then we would just go off into a patch of trees, set up our, our two-man tent. And, and that's it. That's it. Yeah. Wake, wake up Simple early. to do. Yeah. We're back on the road again, and we never yeah. got caught. Yeah. If it was illegal, I have no idea. Some people yeah. said it was, but... And then when we got into towns, you know, um, I had gone ahead and sent postcards to all the arrhythmia training centers. So they knew you were coming. They knew we were coming, and I would phone them a day or so out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not to surprise them. Um, uh, so we... Um, wow, yeah, we got to go to Hanover, and then we came... Of Hamburg, and then we went to the Hanover School, and then we uh, came down into Heidelberg, and then drove, rode along the Necker River. Beautiful, just a beautiful ride everywhere. It was just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, went to Stuttgart, visited a couple of schools there. The, the, I went to Mayum, uh, Frau Mittmann. Uh, then we went to Nuremberg, visited that school. Um, then we uh, Went down to uh, Munich. We went down to Munich. Munich. Yeah, there was a school there, and we visited a biodynamic farm, two biodynamic farms in that area, um, and then we, our last destination was Dornach. Uh huh. And so it's, for me, I said I was on a low budget. Um, I wasn't looking for a school who was who had an instructor that people believed was their master teacher. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I just knew I needed to find a place to live and a, a job. Yeah, you have to have something that you can make money at. Right, a part-time job. And, yeah, and, yeah. Um, and that would be the place I would, uh, I would train in Eurythmy. Yeah. And yeah. I almost, uh, oh, we stopped, we also went to Bonn, or Alfta. Oh, yes. By Bonn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was a great, I mean, we loved to have gone, I would have loved to have gone to that school, because mm -hmm. it's, it's in this old medieval uh, Hof, oh, you yes. know, with a big door that yeah. opens up into the courtyard. Yeah, and, yeah. And there was just, it was just a really incredibly thriving anthroposophical mm -hmm. center, mm -hmm. young people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, when I got to Dornoch, Within the first week, I got a job and a place to work. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was going to train in Dornach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Adrian um, uh, didn't have that, you know, she or she just didn't have that connection to Dornach herself. And um, when we were in Stuttgart, she we visited the Boatmer gymnastics training, mm -hmm. and she really had a connection with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so she eventually ended up, you know, after our bicycle trip, mm -hmm. ended in Dornach. Um, she moved to Stuttgart and enrolled and, into the Boatmer gymnastics training right. with Frau von Boatmer and, and Jimmy McMillan. Mm -hmm. um, but you were ended. You ended up in Dorna. I ended up in Dorna. Um, and um, maybe you can tell me a little bit about that job because 
I can see that it had something to do with the Gertianum. Yeah. Maybe that's you right. can tell us a little bit about that. Right. So I've been always a hard worker. Uh, you know, I can get into my work pretty easily, I guess. I, um, uh, if, anyway, so I got uh, a janitorial job in the Gertianum, and at that time, uh, um, well, realize that when we also part of the bicycle trip that we were doing is that we were able to see and experience at each arrhythmy school their Abschluss, mm -hmm. which is their, their end of the year performance. Mm -hmm. So every place we went, we got to see the, the sort of the cream of what they've been working on the whole year long. Right. It was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And then when we got to Dornock, they had, um, we got to see also the, some of the classes where I think we're still performing, uh, but we, um, we were in something called the English Week. Mm -hmm. They have that every year at the Gertianum, uh -huh. and so mm -hmm. we participated in the English Week. Um, so that was, that was, that was great. Um, and um, I mean, I, did, I just remember pulling up to the Gertianum with Adrian and our, and our you know, our, our touring bicycles, mm -hmm. and we leaned them up against the Gertianum, and we went into the, the, the West Eingang, the West Entrance, mm -hmm. and we made ourselves up the stairs, and the, the red window was, was, you know, washing down, and, mm -hmm. and then we heard this music, and we went to these doors, these big doors, and we, and we, and we open the door and doors open mm -hmm. we peeked in and we and we and we went in and there was a, there was a was the arrhythmic practice going on oh wow mm -hmm. and, we, and we sat ourselves down really quietly mm -hmm. no one saw us i guess um mm -hmm. uh and it was beautiful piece uh heidi kaltenecke who was one ended up being one of my teachers she uh and another arrhythmist i don't know her name but um they were doing a duet uh a piece from Mozart uh, for flute and harp. Oh, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it was amazing. Uh, and we sat and enjoyed that. And then um, somebody then came over and said, "Oh, are you? You know, mm -hmm. are you, what are you doing here?" Right, right. <laughs> oh, right. we're just, you know. Uh, anyway, so then we we we, we that was a really a, an incredible uh, experience for me. Uh, just the, the beauty that Eurythmy can be in, it, in its classical form. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, um, yeah. Which I, you know, truly appreciate. Um, and it was a, probably a Steiner form or something, you know? And that's the reason why I went to Dornock, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I really, you know, partly f just learning German, uh, but that I really wanted to see Rudolf Steiner's works firsthand. Yes. And I wanted to be able to go to the Gertianum, to a place where all his work, and, and not just his visual um, works, but his... Uh, you know, his mystery plays and the arrhythmy and uh, was was faithfully preserved. Yes. And I think that's that's indeed what the task of Dornock is. Yeah. It's to faithfully preserve the works of Rudolf Steiner so that young anthroposophists like myself can go to the Gertianum and, and witness this faithfully preserved and not doctored up and trying to be cutting edge and new age or whatever because, I mean, mm -hmm. that's what... Mm -hmm. I just I just found that out that happens out in the world. That happens out in the world, and I found that out only later. You mm -hmm. know that that, that mm -hmm. concept between point and periphery. Right. That there is, needs to be this kind of dialogue and yep. this, this sort of natural um, existence, natural mm -hmm. beingness of each of those in their task, yeah. so to speak. You know, because the periphery, you know, deals explicitly with the zeitgeist or the time spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so I got my I got a job a, a, as a as a janitor at the Gertianum, and um, we I ended up uh, getting a, a room in House Julian, which mm -hmm. was this really beautiful uh, a student house that was, you know, it's a beautiful house. You know, mm -hmm. thirteen students lived below, and there was a a, a, a rhythmic practice space up top with a oh, beautiful good. Steinway piano, and wow, it was you know really swanky. Um, Mm -hmm. But what was interesting about it is that when I pulled up, and Adrian and I pulled up there with our bicycles, and someone said, oh, you can camp at House Yulian, you could probably sleep on the lawn, because it was summer, you know, and it was warm. It was and okay. Door not. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I pitched my tent there and, and, uh, and hung out there. And right away, I realized that the students that were living there weren't taking care of the place. Oh. Even though they all had chores and things to do. Yeah, yeah. They weren't really... You know, all there were, there were weeds and everywhere, and, and there were things in the house that were falling apart, and they weren't being maintained. And so I just started doing that kind of thing. I can see, you know, one thing my father did teach me 
I'm a grandfather that, you know, you need to be, have your eyes open to what needs to happen so exactly. someone doesn't have to keep telling you all, every exactly. minute, you know, now do this, now do that. Self-motivated. Mm-hmm. Self-motivated. So uh, anyway, they liked that and they said, would you want to live here? And I said, yeah. sure. You know, yeah. So that's, yeah. so my self-motivation. Um, it opens the door. It opened the door. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. So I had a place to live and, and then I got an interview with the first school that gave me an interview, which was the Tsukali Shula, mm-hmm. uh, Frau von Stocker. And I sat down with Frau von Stocker and she's, you know, we talked for a while and, and she said, okay, you know, we will, we'll accept you if you want to mm-hmm. train at this school. And so yeah. I did, you know, yeah. was, um, so, you know, I don't know if this is important note, but there were things that were going on at the Gertianum that were pretty disturbing for me. And even for my for my fellow colleagues living in House Julian. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned uh, a little bit about uh, the cleaning products and uh, how you know in a place like that you would expect that they would have cleaning products that are uh, a little bit more eco friendly. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah, it was yeah. it was disturbing. Um, but uh, I understand also that that changed then over time. When, well, when it, it changed, it? but it, it it changed through my efforts of, of basically being, you know, aggressive and yes, and, and yes. sort of. Um, well, somebody has to point it out. I had to point it out, and not only had to point it out, I had to keep pointing it out year after yes. year and, yeah. and and get angry about it. When when did it actually change? It changed when. Because <laughs> we're talking eighty nine, I think something like that when you went there. Yeah, I, that was my first year of training in eighty nine. Um, it changed over a couple of years, but really it only changed because the people who were, who were ahead of these different departments had retired. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what always has to happen. They had you to know, retire, lucky. and I had to give pressure on the other side. To to. So what what happened is that my 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 roommates at House Julian said, Dean, you know. You know, I would come back from work and I go, I can't even believe what's going on there. Mm-hmm. They're, they're cleaning with poison. Yeah. And there's yeah. a biodynamic farm in the backyard. Yeah. Yeah. They're poisoning the water cycle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the water is an important element in oh, our yeah. lives. And, and, and of course, at that time, that was a little avant garde because I think it's only in the last 10 years or so that we've become more aware of what we're doing to the water. To the water, yeah. And I mean, this is now 2013. Right. It's not 1989. I know. You right. know, so you were way ahead of your time as far as I can see. I guess. Um, I was just concerned that, you know, how long has this been going on? Exactly. And, exactly. you know, the, you know the, the people who are in charge there, you know, they retired, you know, so they've been going on for decades. Oh, yeah. Poisoning oh, yeah. the earth. Oh, yeah. In the water cycle. Anyway. So, so, so the lady who was in charge of uh, cleaning the bathrooms in, in the, for the public bathrooms retired, and uh, there was a lady in town, her name was Linda Monte mm-hmm. at that time, and she... Um, had her own uh, natural cleaning service in, mm-hmm. in Basel uh, and in, in around the, the rural areas around Basel. And so they hired one of her workers, and her name was Frau Kiester. And when she showed up, I'd already stopped using the poison that they were telling me I had to use on the floor because I was just mopping the floor, I yeah. was just getting the dust off the floor. Yeah. It didn't need to be, you know, killed with chemicals. Um, And I refused to use it and, you know, there was some tension that I was going to lose my job if I didn't, you know, use this Mm -hmm. poison. Um, Well, she showed up to, and she, we we had a dialogue about this and she said, why don't you use my cleaning products? Yes, exactly. And so it was incredible because when she told me this whole story about the, the, there was a family that lived in Arlesheim, which is the town right next to Dornach. Who was who was making these natural cleaning products out of their garage, yeah. and they were struggling to even stay in existence. Yeah. Um, and and uh, because they weren't weren't they weren't selling their products. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And apparently, uh, right about that time, uh, a European uh, uh, the European uh, companies did a survey on the most effective cleaning products. Right. So they, you know all the ones the Acover and whatever all the the, the the big names were back then, mm-hmm. were matched up with this small company, this small anthroposophical company that, that you know, made their products out of the mm-hmm. garage in Arlesheim, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. ended up being the most effective cleaning products. There you go. 